Welcome to our video, Japan and Nuclear Deterrence. I would like to focus on the commentary in 1945.com, the 30th of June 2023, by Mr. Dan Blumenthal, a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where he focuses on East Asian security issues and Sino-American relations. There is a security awakening in Japan. Hastened by the Russian invasion of Ukraine and China's more aggressive use of its military around the Japanese archipelago. National security leaders in Tokyo are serious about spending more money on national defense and revamping Japanese posture to better confront Chinese, Russian, and North Korean aggression. Japan is moving decisively to confront the new geopolitical era catalyzed by Russia's invasion with a comprehensive new national security strategy. Not only is Tokyo building up its self-defense forces, Japan is also taking a global lead among industrial powers in economic preparedness. Moreover, it is leading the international diplomacy necessary to form and maintain a counter-China-Russia coalition. Economically, Tokyo is implementing a law that reduces reliance on China in critical industries such as semiconductors. Better prepares the Japanese economy for a possible conflict and guards against peacetime economic coercion. Diplomatically, Japan has used its presidency of the G7 this year to internationalize East Asian security concerns, garnering support for pushback against China in the Taiwan Strait. But it is on national defense posture that Japan's changes are the most comprehensive. In a break from self-imposed post-World War II taboos, Tokyo is set to acquire counter-strike capabilities, specifically, long-range missiles that can hit military targets in the enemy homeland. This will take Japan beyond its traditional posture of almost purely defensive capabilities. While Japanese energy and initiative is a welcome contribution to deterrence, this decision means that the next phase of the Japanese national security evolution will necessarily be even more difficult. As it seeks the ability to strike back at its enemies, Japan will be forced to overcome its historical allergy to even discussing nuclear questions. The reason for this needed change is that China's growing strategic forces loom over Japan's defense strategy changes. Beijing is on the cusp of a nuclear breakout. Tokyo and Washington will have to rethink the contours of nuclear deterrence just as they are doing regarding conventional military power. The Japanese public largely agrees with the profound concern expressed by Japanese Prime Minister Kishida about Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The Prime Minister captured public concern by stating, Ukraine today. East Asia tomorrow. The shock of Russian aggression was even more acute in Japan than elsewhere in Asia as Tokyo had been trying to work with Vladimir Putin to settle a territorial dispute in the hope that greater Japanese-Russian cooperation could check China. It turned out that the settlement never came, and that the dictator could not be appeased on any core issue. The invasion of Ukraine made the possibility of a war of aggression by a large authoritarian power very real. Japanese leaders privately make the historical analogy to Europeans taking their own security more seriously after the North Korean invasion of South Korea with Soviet and Communist Chinese support in 1950. Both cases are reminders of the tragic history of world wars. When a great power aggressor starts a war, there can be a global contagion of aggression with spillover from one region to the next. Moreover, China's staunch support for the invasion as expressed in a joint Sino-Russian communique of February 22, 2022 was hardly missed in Tokyo. China provided its stamp of approval to the invasion of a sovereign nation, while blaming the US and NATO for Russia's aggression. This is tantamount to validating aggressive revisionism, a policy Japan cannot abide. To be sure, Japan has been grappling with China's massive program of military modernization well before the invasion. Thanks to decades of military modernization, the People's Liberation Army, PLA, 
now has a formidable force of conventional missiles, the world's largest navy and coast guard, and an advanced air fighter capability that frequently intrudes into Japan's air defense identification zone. Beijing's defense strategy is focused on what it calls near seas defense and maritime rights protection. These anodyne sounding terms in reality translate into ever more aggression in the Taiwan Straits. Around the Senkaku Islands, and inside China's self proclaimed yet illegal territories in the South China Sea. But the Russian invasion crystallized for Japan that China's troubling, gray zone, threats can turn into large scale war. Defense changes. In response, Prime Minister Kishida announced a new defense budget of 6.8 trillion yen, $50 billion. 20% more than last year and changed Japan's National Defense Program guidelines to the National Defense Strategy, NDS, to mirror the U.S. National Defense Strategy making. While certain capabilities such as improving Japan's ability to protect air and missile strikes against its own and allied bases on Japan were uncontroversial, the most potentially consequential change in Japanese defense strategy is its plan to both acquire from the U.S. and build its own long-range strike capability, which will provide it with the ability to hit targets on mainland China and North Korea. Generally speaking, the alliance has traditionally assigned Japan the role of the alliance's shield, focused on air and missile defense as well as anti-submarine and anti-surface warfare. Meanwhile the U.S. was the sword, able to strike China's massive number of targets to cripple its potential invasion fleets and its war-making capacity. Given the multitude of threats it now faces, Japan is understandably no longer satisfied with this arrangement. While all of Japan's proposed changes will require more conceptual work and a deepening of cooperation within the alliance. The desire to acquire counterstrike change will be particularly demanding as Japanese self-defense force potentially targets the homeland of nuclear-armed countries. This comes at a time when China is clearly indicating its own nuclear rethink. Evolution of Japanese attitudes on strike, the limits of missile defense. Japan's plans for counterstrike were hardly a surprise. The late Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, as part of his epical changes to Japan's grand strategy, had begun the Japanese debate about a shift in defense policy. In 2019, Tokyo released a defense program document called National Defense Program Guidelines for Fiscal Year 2019 and Beyond, which highlighted its interest in procuring a standoff defense capability. Tokyo has acquired or is acquiring the Jasmer missile and the LRASM which would notionally be used against Chinese ships from Japanese strike aircraft. While the missile provides Japan with the capability to target Chinese vessels from longer range, it still fundamentally fits with a traditional Japanese anti-ship mission. Japan's debate about long-range capabilities centered on the difficulty of only relying on passive defenses such as missile defenses and base and port hardening given the difficulty of countering technologically advanced offensive missiles, in particular hypersonic vehicles and hypersonic cruise missiles, HCMs, which are extremely difficult for traditional missile defense capabilities to intercept. The PLA will likely be operating an arsenal of hypersonic weapons, which are low-flight missiles with irregular trajectories. It will also likely be employing swarms of unmanned aerial vehicles. As part of Japan's new defense strategy, the U.S. and Japan have a development program to address the HGV threat, but such defensive countermeasures will take time and money. Toward long-range strike. More combined investment needed. As Japan considers the purchase of U.S. Tomahawk missiles and the production of domestically designed long-range cruise missiles, it will also need the ability to develop what military officials call a kill chain, the ability to find, track, fix, and finish targets at longer range. This supporting infrastructure, 
even for limited strike capabilities, is expensive, requiring sophisticated sensors, satellites, and long-range radars as well as sophisticated technical capabilities to transmit the targeting information to those shooters. Striking targets thousands of miles away will require Japan to build out a much more robust intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance capabilities. Japan will surely not be satisfied solely relying upon the U.S. for such capabilities. No country would. Nevertheless, in the medium term, Japan will have to rely on the U.S., which in turn requires a much greater degree of integration with U.S. forces including command and control at the highest levels. Such changes will necessitate difficult transformations of Japanese defense culture, which still has serious prohibitions against combined planning and execution. In order for Japan's counterstrike plans to succeed, the U.S. and Japan's operational and war plans will also need to be harmonized, and in some cases, combined. That's all for part one. To be continued to part two.